Welcome. We wish you all a warm welcome and we're thrilled to see so many of you joining us from around the world for our fifth webinar in our Dream Destination series. My name is Nikki Stewart from Rock Jumper Birding Mauritius, moderating today's webinar together with our Managing Director Keith Valentine from Rock Jumper Birding South Africa. Today we take a classic virtual safari to the vast plains of the Serengeti and the Ngorogoro Crater, where Africa's most famous animals still reside in magnificent numbers and the bird life is prolific. We love to hear from you, so please um, feel free to chat to us in the Q&A or the chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, or if you are watching us on Facebook live stream, send us your questions in the Facebook, uh, Facebook chat. Uh, we will have time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. Our speaker today is Rock Jumper's founder, Adam Riley. Adam has grown up um, Adam has grown up with a lifelong interest in wildlife, which evolved into a particular fascination with birds. Raised in the rural region of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, Adam qualified as a chartered accountant. But in 1998, his career path took an alternative route when he founded Rock Jumper Birding Tours. Adam has traveled extensively to all seven continents leading tours to numerous countries, ranging from Colombia to Egypt, Angola to Papua New Guinea, Antarctica to Alaska. Adam is one of Africa's most experienced birders, having seen over 2,000 species on the continent, as well as 8,000 species worldwide. Interesting fact uh, about Adam is that in 1993, he was the world number one powerlifting champion in his weight category and was eating up to 50 eggs a day. But to us at Rock Jumper, Adam is our mentor and coach who has an unquestionable passion and knowledge for the natural world. He has given many of us more than a job or a career, but purpose through Rock Jumper's core values of people, service, progression, and conservation. Welcome, Adam and the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for, for joining me um, to um, visit one of my favorite areas in the world, which is the Ngorongoro Crater and Serengeti in Northern Tanzania. So here's a map of the area that we'll be focusing on. Um, and the brown, brown area that you can see Within the map, the darker brown is the Serengeti ecosystem, which spans approximately 12,000 square miles or 37,000 square kilometers. If you're familiar with Kruger National Park, this is less than 20,000 square kilometers. So it's, it's more than double the size of the Kruger National Park. And it comprises several sections, including the Ngorongoro Conservation Area on, this, on the bottom, southeast, um, the central area is the Serengeti National Park and the Grimeti Controlled Area to the west. And all of that within Tanzania. And then in Kenya, the Masamara National Reserve actually for forms part of the Serengeti ecosystem. And here we have our next picture is um, the view from one of the lodges that we use. This is on the rim of the Serengeti. Um, this is Serengeti Sopa Lodge on the eastern side of the crater, looking out onto the crater. And it's one, one of the fabulous birding and wildlife lodges of the world. So the Ngorongoro Conservation Area lies approximately 100 miles west of Arusha in, in Tanzania. That's the safari capital of, of Tanzania and main entry point to this uh, part of northern Tanzania. Um, so the Ngorongoro Conservation Area is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is the world's largest inactive, intact and unfilled volcanic caldera. It has an amazing sunset again from, from the lodge. So the crater was actually created by a volcano that uh, exploded um, about two to three million years ago. 
and collapse this, this huge mountain or this huge volcano in, on, on itself. They estimate that the volcano was up to about 19,000 feet or 5,800 meters high, which would have made it just slightly uh, lower than Kilimanjaro, Africa's highest point. Um, and when this, this volcano collapsed on itself, it created this huge crater. And at the same time, it also deposited vast layers of ash, um, which created the, the vast and almost endless plains of the Serengeti, which we will discuss um, shortly. So Ngorongoro is an onomatopoeic name given to the crater by the Maasai pastoralists. And it's the noise or the sound produced by cowbells. Um, and, and that's where, where the name comes from. And here in this picture, you'll see the, the rich Afromontane forests on the eastern side of the crater walls. The crater highlands on, on the eastern side, which face the uh, trade winds, receive up to about 47 inches or 1200 millimeters of rain. And therefore, this large amount of rain creates this beautiful Afromontane forest environment. The less deep west walls receive much less rain, about 16 to 24 inches or 400 to 600 millimeters, and they comprise mostly grassland and bushland dotted with euphorbia trees. Here's a section on the eastern side below the, the Afro-Montane forest that contains uh, beautiful stands of, of mountain acacia. And these forests um, uh, harbor quite a few different birds that you don't actually see uh, and animals um, in the crater itself. So it's a, it's a fantastic area for, for wildlife viewing. Um, some of the creatures that we, we look for on our tours in this area include this blue monkey. And it's one of the best places in the world for seeing tree hyrax. Um, the, the common uh, bush or, or, or rock hyraxes are much easier to see. The tree hyraxes are mostly nocturnal and live in forests and you hear their unearthly screaming at night, but they're extremely difficult to see. But here around the Serengeti Serpa Lodge, there's um, a small population that um, you can actually see in the early morning. Some of the birds that we look for in these forests include the apex predator of, of Africa's uh, forests. This is the crowned eagle. Similar to, to South America's harpy eagle, this uh, crowned eagle feeds on primates and um, uh, some antelope and large bird species. Some of the other birds that we um, search for here um, in the forest and forest edge include Hildebrandt's Franklin, which we usually see quite a few of them as we're driving down in the early morning on the edge of the road. And these absolutely stunning cinnamon chested bee eaters, which sit in open glades in the forest and fly out from perches um, catching insects. Another vocal species that um, can be quite difficult to see is the uh, tropical boo-boo. And there's good numbers of quite a few other forest species. This is a white-eyed slaty flycatcher, and this is a juvenile. You can see all the spots on the wing and, and the breast. The adults are, are plain gray. Baglefecht weaver is another species that's, that's very common in this area. And one of my favorite is this beautiful white eye. This is the montane white eye with uh, this huge, huge um, prominent white eye ring. So it actually doesn't have a white eye. All the white eyes are, are fairly badly named. It's the eye ring, not the eye itself, which is white. And one of the more difficult and sought after species is this thick billed seed eater. Um, another fairly secretive uh, bird that you, that you get um, in, in this habitat is, is this lovely gray capped warbler. A very large warbler with a beautiful song and has this cherry red throat patch and shoulder patch and this distinctive gray crown or cap. And these forests are particularly rich in um, sunbirds. Um, this is one of my favorite photos that I took just around Sopa Lodge itself. This is the eastern double collared sunbird. And you can see here it's got these beautiful yellow pectoral tufts um, flush, flushed out and this is part of its display um, of the male. You also get Takazi sunbird with this lovely metallic purple chest. And probably my favorite of all the sunbirds, uh, one of the strangest sunbirds in the world, this is the golden wing sunbird with this lovely curved beak and beautiful golden wings and tail. So as we exit the forest, we get to uh, more scrubby areas, which hold um, 
a slightly different uh, selection of birds and animals. And just as an aside, the, the first European to set foot in the crater was only in 1892. It was a German by the name of Oscar Baumann. And this, this whole region, as we'll discuss a little bit later, is dominated by the Maasai tribe, who are extremely fierce and, and um, dangerous tribe. And as a result of this, you had very few explorers coming into this area. Um, hence, it took so long for the first, uh, first Westerner to, to actually discover the crater and, and enter it. Um, it actually became um, a, a farm. It was given over to two to German brothers who farmed the crater until the start of World War I. And then in 1921, it became a protected area. So back to the birds. Um, here we have an auger buzzard, which is one of the typical birds of, of the lower slope. Here you can see it uh, perched on, on an acacia tree. White-browed kukul is another very common species that you get in this area. And one of the specials of this area is the Pangani long claw. Red-collared water birds are also very prevalent um, in, in these, these scrubby areas. And for those of you from, from Southern Africa, you'll, you'll notice this red-collared water bird has a lot more red on it. Uh, ours in the Southern part of Africa just have the red um, slash across the throat, um, hence the name red collar, whereas those further north um, have red coming onto the head. And once you get to Ethiopia, the entire head is actually red. And finally, you enter the crater floor itself. This crater floor is at elevation of 6,000 feet or 1,800 meters above sea level. And the crater wall, walls are, are 2,000 feet um, or 610 meters high. And the area of the crater floor is 100 square miles or 260 square kilometers. So it's a sizable area. Um, there's no lodges down in the crater. So you, everyone comes down from, from lodges around the rim early in the morning and spends the day exploring the crater. Um, and the, it's mostly open grassland with two small wooded areas dominated by fever trees, a few wetland areas and, and lakes. So some of the, the typical birds you get here on the crater, this is the world's heaviest um, flying bird. This is the quarry busted. And they are, are particularly common um, on, on the crater. Wonderful birds to see. And one of my favorite birds is the gray crowned crane. Um, and I took this photo on my last visit to the crater. And uh, also wonderful to see these three little chicks walking with, with the parent. Another one of my favorite uh, photos, uh, again, this is from the crater, and this was actually a full frame photo. The birds and animals in the crater are, are so used to tourists coming down and, and wildlife viewers that you can get exceptionally close to them. And I took this full frame photo of this gray crown crane. You can see the, the beautiful um, hair-like feathers on the crown making this, this, um, these spikes and uh, the bare white and red skin on the face, the beautiful blue eye, it really is um, one of the world's classiest birds. The world's largest bird is also uh, common here. You see good numbers of, of common ostrich. And another bird that you hear a lot um, is the rufous nape lark. Um, these chaps sit up uh, throughout the crater on, on little raised posts or, or, or rocky areas. And um, they sing all day long and after every eight to ten calls they flap their wings and rise a few inches into the air like as you can see in this image and back down again and keep on singing. There's also good populations of starlings uh, in the crater, several species. Um, this is actually one of the commonest birds that you see in East Africa. We call it the superstar, um, more commonly known as superb starling. Um, this is the Hildebrand starling, which is also uh, found uh, throughout the crater. Um, another bird that loves the open grasslands is the northern anteater chat, and they often found sitting on termite mounds, and they actually nest inside these termite mounds. And one of the coolest birds of the crater is this Jackson's widow bird. They, in areas of, of moister, longer grass, and during display season, um, they have one of the most wonderful displays where they hide out of view in, gra in the grass and then just jump out and back down again, jump out, back down again. So it looks like this black sort of uh, apostrophe jumping out of the grass. They, they really are amazing. 
It's also one of the best places in the world to see the rosy-throated longclaw in these slightly moister grasslands. And the crater is also probably one of the best places in the world to see the uh, African quail finch, a tiny little bird that feeds on grass seeds. You can see it here holding um, some grass in its beak, and they're particularly common in the crater. Another seed eater that you, you get here is the uh, purple grenadier, a really spectacular bird. As I mentioned, there's also a few wetlands, and um, some of them are, one is a particularly salty lake um, that you get, uh, occurs here, and as a result, uh, you get a lot of flamingos. Um, this is a flock of uh, lesser flamingos, just flying against the crater walls. Some of the other wetland birds that you can expect to see include the uh, gray heron. This one's just caught a tiny little fish, great egret, and if you're lucky, you can get to see the uh, greater painted snipe. The painted snipes are, are quite an interesting uh, group of birds. Um, they're not related to the normal uh, snipes. They're, they're in their own family. There's three species. And uh, they're most closely related to jacanas. And they um, have a polyandrous behavior. So the female is actually the back bird and the more colorful, larger, and dominant one. And the female has a territory of, of, of several different males. And she will fight off um, other females who try and encroach upon her males. Um, and that's her territory. And uh, she lays eggs with each of, of the different males in her territory. And that's the end of her um, child rearing duties. The males then raise the young and uh, take, take care of them until, until they fledge. Another bird that uh, is particularly good uh, here on the crater in, in, in this uh, very alkaline lake is the uh, chestnut banded plover. Beautiful, beautiful little um, species of wader. And the animals themselves, which we'll come to shortly, even provide habitat for the birds. Uh, this is a family of yellow billed oxpeckers. But the one bird that you shouldn't uh, and not pay attention to at your own peril is the yellow-billed kite. Um, there's only a, a few areas in the crater where you're actually allowed to get out and have a picnic um, during the day and all the tourists stop there. And it's got worse and worse over the years with these yellow-billed kites who, that dominate these areas and will actually fly down and take food right out of your hands or out of your mouth as, you, as you're trying to bite your sandwiches or, or whatever food the lodge uh, provides you for the day. Um, so they are a real hazard down in the crater. So moving on to the animals, um, the, the crater itself is, is said to, to have the, the most densest uh, known population of, of large animals in the whole world. Approximately 25,000 large animals um, are resident in the crater, mostly ungulates. Um, about 7,000 uh, blue wildebeest, about 4,000 plain zebra. But it does have one of the densest populations of lion in the world, uh, with a population fluctuating between 65 and 100 individuals in the crater. And these lions are pretty bomb proof. Um, this is a photo I took from the top of our vehicle during um, one of our, our recent safaris. And everyone had to literally drive around these lions that obviously had a big hunt the night before. You can see a full stomach on this lioness. There were actually several of them in this pride. And they were just completely slogged out in the middle of the road and ignoring everyone, sleeping off the previous night's hard work of killing. You do get several other species of cats, uh, cheetah, leopard in small numbers. And it's also quite a good place for, for seeing serval, a, a small cat of the grasslands of, of Africa. It also has probably the highest population and density of spotted hyenas of anywhere in the world. Um, you can literally see 50 to 100 or, or more at a time um, during your, your day around the crater. Um, I took this photo on a, on a trip recently and a group of hyenas had pulled down a wildebeest in, in one of these water holes and there was about 15 or 18 hyenas ripping this wildebeest apart. And then just looking out, we could just see hyenas coming in from every direction, just more and more and more to, to share in this feast. 
The crater is also famous for its elephants, and they say it's, it's probably the only place in Africa where elephants have never been hunted. But what's interesting about the elephants in the crater is that the crater walls are so steep that you very, very rarely get uh, matriarchal herds of, of elephants. So it's essentially just these big old bulls that dominate the crater. And you get some amazing huge tuskers, and they're very, very relaxed and chilled here in the crater. Some of the biggest elephants I've seen anywhere in Africa. It's also very good numbers of buffalo, African or Cape buffalo. And um, here's a typical old male covered in mud. Um, they're often called dagger boys, dagger meaning mud in, in several African languages. And uh, that's very much the habit of these older males that, that leave the herds and live out their lives in solitude. And um, so grumpy, they irritate themselves and are actually probably the most dangerous animal in Africa to come across on foot. There's also a small population of the uh, critically endangered black rhinoceros. There used to be about a hundred of them in the crater in the 1970s, but um, sadly, due to um, rhino poaching, there's about a dozen um, remaining in the crater. But we do, do generally get to see them um, during our, our time on the crater. Quite a few other animals as well, um, too many to even go through, but uh, some of the typical species we see in the crater include Grant's gazelle, the slightly smaller um, Thompson's gazelle. So just outside the crater, but within the Ngorongoro conservation area, you do get um, homesteads of, of Maasai. And the Ngorongoro conservation area is the only conservation area in Tanzania that protects wildlife whilst also allowing human habitation. And this is a, a typical Maasai homestead um, with, uh, you can see the sticks around um, or, or the wooden fence around it to protect um, the, the cattle which live in the central boma from attacks by lions and, and other predators. So hominid species have actually occupied this area for at least three million years. Um, Hunter-gatherers were replaced by pastoralists a few thousand years ago. The Mbulu tribe arrived about 2,000 years ago and were joined by the Datuga around about 1700 AD. But both tribes were driven out by the Maasai in the 1800s. And the Maasai are permitted to, to graze their cattle even within the crater. Um, and they do come down, um, particularly in the dry season. Um, but they have to um, exit um, the crater daily um, back to their, to their homesteads. And they're a, a tribe that um, traditionally just live um, It's proven invaluable in furthering the understanding of early hominid evolution. Mary and Louis Leakey established and developed the excavation and research pr programs at Olduvai, which achieved great advances in um, human knowledge um, and a world-renowned status. So Homo habilis, probably the first early hominid species, occupied um, Olduvai Gorge approximately 2 million years ago. Then came Nutcracker Man or Paranthropus boisea about 1.8 million years ago and Homo erectus about 1.2 million years ago. And the type specimens or basically the very first discovery of all three of these hominids um, all came from Olduvai Gorge. Our species Homo sapiens, which is estimated to have emerged roughly 300,000 years ago, is known to have occupied this site from at least 17,000 years. There's also an excellent museum at Old Divine, uh, not only showing the, the early uh, history of, of hominids in the area, but also a lot of the extinct and existing animal species of whose remains and, and fossils have been discovered at this site. Moving westwards, we finally come to the Great Serengeti Plains. The name Serengeti uh, 
is, is the Masa, comes from the Masa word Serengit, which means the place where the land runs on forever. As you can see in this picture, it gives you that appearance. And this is Tanzania's oldest national park. It covers 5,700 square miles or 14,750 square kilometers, mostly grassland um, with, with some dotted trees here and there, areas of savanna, um, a few riverine forest uh, strips and woodlands. Um, one of the easiest ways of accessing it is, of course, by small airplane from Arusha. Um, this is a, a photo from a trip I did with, with my family, my two little boys and my wife a few years ago, um, where we basically flew right across to the western part of the Serengeti, the Grumeti, and then slowly made our way back um, eastwards across, across the Serengeti. Another way of, of exploring this area is by hot air balloon, and there's several operations um, that uh, offer this, um, one near the, the lodge that we use, so, so it is available on our tours to do a balloon ride. And it really is an amazing way um, to, to experience the Serengeti. And the birds and animals you see are, are amazing. You fly really high up and you can see herds of, of elephant and buffalo and then low down and we actually picked up cheetah. And we even uh, flushed several um, corn crack um, on, on my most recent balloon flight out of the grassland. And there's quite a range of, of accommodation in the Serengeti. In some areas they've put up um, mobile tented camps such as this one in, in absolute wilderness. And it's just a wonderful way to wake up in the morning. Yeah, my, here's another photo from my family safari and have uh, a breakfast just watching the sunrise in absolute wilderness. We had leopards and cheetahs right around camp. My son was, however, somewhat disappointed that they didn't have a swimming pool um, during the heat of the day, but the camp attendants were, were very attentive and uh, made up a plan here for him. Right through to some in incredibly luxurious lodges. Uh, this is one of the um, uh, Singita lodges in, in the Grumeti. Um, beautiful rooms. Um, and this is actually a remote control window that, that opens and closes uh, in, in the room. It was absolutely amazing looking over the Grumeti River. Um, and here's a, one of my favorite pictures of, of my two boys having an absolute blast uh, in the lobby of, of one of the lodges. And um, here's another a picture from one of the lodges that we stayed at and uh, had this beautiful room flow pool in the front of us and uh, we frequently had uh, visitors such as the, this troop of baboons coming down to, to also enjoy the rim flow pool. Um, and basically you spend your days out in open safari vehicles um, just exploring the birds and, and animals of the Serengeti. Um, here's, a, here's a picture of my family having a, a well-deserved coffee break after a, a hard moon, morning of game viewing. So one of the features of the Serengeti are these uh, uh, rock outcrops or, or kopis. Um, and if you've watched Lion King, you'll, you'll know that famous uh, Simba Kopi scene. And that's actually inspired from a, a real place in the Serengeti called Simba Kopis. And true to life, the, most of the kopis do have a pride of lions that uh, are resident there and um, dominate these, these um, kopis. Um, some of the other denizens of, of these rocky outcrops include um, two species of hyrax, rock hyrax, and here we have yellow spotted bush hyrax. Uh, these are three little youngsters, very cute little creatures. And one of the world's most beautiful um, lizards, um, this is the Mwanza flat-headed agama, which is extremely common in these rock outcrops. Yeah, the Serengeti has the largest population of lions in the world um, as a result of the abundance of prey. There's more than 3,000 lions um, live in this ecosystem. Um, yeah, I took these photos on, on a recent trip. Um, we, we found a, a, about four or five cubs, and in the distance, we saw two females walking in towards the cubs, and they met up. Obviously, the females have been out hunting and all the usual feline sort of rubbing and, and um, greeting behavior. And then they walked off a short distance to a little water hole where they started drinking and they drank for quite a long time. And all of a sudden, one of the females started growling and clawing at the earth. And you can see them here growling again. 
and they're very, very uneasy around this water hole. And I thought something, something's obviously disturbed them. Um, and once they'd, they'd left the water hole, we drove up and there was this huge African rock python that almost filled the entire water hole. I can't believe the lions actually drank as long as they did without noticing it. And this was obviously lying in ambush for, for some animal, but fortunately not the lions, to come down and drink. There's also more than 300 cheetah on, in the Serengeti, um, again, one of the biggest populations in the world, if not the biggest population. And they're fairly easily seen in these open grasslands. Um, another wonderful experience we had with, with cheetah, we were watching this, this female with, with a young cub, and they were lying down, and all of a sudden the female just woke up. Obviously, she'd got a sniff in the air, and the, maybe the wind had changed direction, and she jumped up, ran to a fallen log, sort of peered off in a certain direction, sprinted straight into some bushes, flushed out the scrub hair, chased it down within a, in a flash, and um, brought it uh, over to, to the youngster and they enjoyed uh, a, a small feast. There's also good numbers of leopard um, in the Serengeti, uh, about a thousand are estimated. And certainly in, in, in the areas that, that are quite grassy, um, they're fairly easy to see because there, there's very few trees and the leopards can usually be found sleeping in the trees during the day. Um, so it's a, it's a particularly good area for seeing leopards. Um, this is one that we actually found uh, on, on the grass plains itself and it was much more nervous. The leopards in the trees are pretty generally very relaxed. Um, this one ran off uh, once it realized we'd spotted it and climbed up to, to a high tree. Well, it was quite interesting, there was a troop of baboons nearby which saw it running towards a tree and chased it all the way up the tree and kept on barking at it. The leopard went to the very top. Here you can actually see some elant in the background that were also eyeing the leopard out. The Serengeti also has large numbers of, of uh, hyenas. Um, so about 5,000 of the spotted hyenas, which we discussed in the Ngorongoro section, but it also has a small population of striped hyena, which occurs from the Serengeti into Asia. And if you're very lucky, you can get to see a striped hyena as well. The African wild dog or, or painted wolf as it's also known, actually became extinct uh, in, in the Serengeti um, in, in the 90s. What, what was interesting is it, it was the job of the game rangers in, in the early days to actually shoot the African wild dogs that are considered vermin. And throughout many of the game reserves in Africa, they were actually exterminated. And you, you sometimes get populations outside of the game reserves, but they still don't come into the game reserves because they were shot for so many years. Anyway, they have now been reintroduced into the Serengeti ecosystem, and if you're lucky, you can get to see them. Um, here's a photo of, of a pack um, taking down a, a diker. It's also a good place for seeing um, caracal, which is one of the uh, larger of the smaller cat species um, that you get here. And um, three species of jackal. And what's interesting is, is the African gold, the golden jackal, which uh, is an in this image. Um, DNA has been done on the Serengeti population because um, the behavior of this golden jackal is not like the behavior of golden jackals in, in Middle East and Asia where they um, also occur. These ones here actually hunt in packs and pull down prey. So they did some long-term research in DNA and actually realized that these golden jackals are, are, are not actually golden jackals, but there is a, a cryptic species or subspecies of gray wolf. So they're a diminutive wolf and not golden jackal at all, which they, they looked like. So that was quite a major um, find uh, quite recently. And you get many species of, of smaller predators. These are dwarf mongoose, but numerous species of, of mongoose, civet, um, genet, etc. The world's largest land uh, animal, of course, is the African elephant, and um, over 5,000 uh, occur here in the Serengeti Park, particularly in the northern section. They were hit quite hard by poaching in the 80s, but the populations have recovered well. You also get healthy populations of giraffe, and the subspecies here is the Maasai giraffe. Again, go what's quite interesting is uh, you do not get giraffe in the Ngorongoro crater. The, 
the crater walls are too steep for them to actually descend into the crater, but they are, are very common in the Serengeti. Huge numbers of hippos. Um, this is one of the pools in dry season, absolutely filled with chock-a-block with hippos. And this was a photo I took um, of a, of, on a tour recently where um, a, um, a young male hippo was trying to enter into the water hole during the day. And this large dominant bull hippo was already in the water hole and he was not having this young male uh, coming into his territory. And it was getting hotter and hotter. Hippos don't do very well under heat. And this male, uh, the young male was desperately trying to get in, but he just knew that if he jumped past these huge gaping jaws that he would get a, a good hiding from this dominant bull. And this standoff went on for about uh, 30 minutes before the male, young male eventually decided it just wasn't worth his while and ran off to find a more conducive uh, water hole. Some of the other mammals you get here, this is an impala. Um, here you have um, sesabi, um, also known as congoni, and uh, this is coax hartebeest. Um, also get them in, in good, good numbers. Um, and uh, Africa's largest antelope also occurs in good numbers. This is a, an elant, it's a massive, massive uh, individual. Um, right down to some of our smallest antelopes, such as this Kirk's dick dick. And even different species of bats um, obviously occur here. Um, on, on the left, you have hot nosed bats, on, on the right, Mauritian tomb bat. And my son was even more fascinated with the bugs. He's, he's an absolute uh, fanatic about bugs. Um, here he pulled all these, these um, insects off the walls of our tent that have been attracted by light. Going on to birds, um, the Serengeti is, is wonderful for, for species that they call indicator species. So um, birds that, that only do well in really pristine environments. Um, and, and become extinct uh, as soon as there's, there's disturbance. Um, one of these is leopard-faced vultures. There's less than 2,000 of these vultures throughout its range from the Middle East right through Africa. But in the Serengeti, you can see many, many of them, often pairs like this perched in a small acacia tree with their nest nearby. Um, Africa's largest uh, eagle, martial eagle, occurs also in, in very, very healthy numbers as does the batelier, which flies low over the grasslands and, and savanna in search of um, carrion um, during the day. Nowhere else in the world can you see as many secretary birds as you, you see in the Serengeti, um, and many of them are also extremely tame. You can drive right up to them and um, get full frame photos like this. Right down to tiny raptors, such as the uh, African pygmy falcon. Um, and even the animals here um, provide habitat for, for some of the birds. This is a, a black crake walking across a, a pot of hippos in one of the water holes in the Serengeti. Many uh, grassland species are, are obviously occur here in, in good numbers. Um, this is a Koki Franklin um, calling his heart out early in the morning and the whole grassland plain seems to echo with uh, Koki Franklin song. Get several species of courses. Um, here we have a Temminx courser with a rufous cap. And the more nocturnal Hoiglins or three-banded courser is also fairly common, as well as the bronze-winged or violet-tipped courser. This one actually had a small chick nearby. Another really good indicator species um, that occurs in healthy numbers here in the Serengeti is the southern ground hornbill. A magnificent bird living in small family groups and just striding across the Serengeti. And quite a few other species of hornbills occur, including this Fonda Deccan's hornbill. It's very good for bustards and, and other ground birds. This is the northern white-bellied bustard. And here we have the black-bellied bustard. Several species of sand grass occur, including this lovely yellow-throated sand grass, which is the largest species occurring uh, in Africa. Some of the uh, woodland birds include the, the go-away bird. Um, this is the bare-faced go-away bird. And here we have gray-hooded kingfisher with a cricket it just caught. 
Nubian woodpeckers, uh, one of the commonest woodpeckers of, of the Serengeti woodlands. And you also get wonderful populations of bee eaters. This is a migrant blue cheek bee eater that at certain times of year occurs in really good numbers. Cap wheatiers prefer the more open areas, as does the uh, Black Lord Babbler. And here we have the northern white crowned shrike, another very conspicuous bird sitting out in the open, um, as does the, the silver bird, which is a beautiful um, species of flycatcher. They have quite a few sunbirds again. Uh, this is the very aptly named beautiful sunbird. And here we have the uh, scarlet chested sunbird um, attracted by some flowering aloes. Lots of species of seed eaters uh, also occur here in the Serengeti. Here, here we have um, speckle fronted uh, weavers, um, white headed buffalo weaver. And uh, during one of my recent trips, there'd been good rains in the Serengeti and everywhere um, we found flocks of cardinal quelia, one of the rarest of the quelia species, as you can see here, feeding on grass. Blue cap cordon bleu occurs as does red cheek cordon bleu. Um, however, the birds that birders really come to the Serengeti for are a group of, of endemic and near endemic species. Um, one of them is the gray breasted spurfowl, which is endemic to the Serengeti ecosystem. Absolutely beautiful um, species of Franklin. You can see this delicate feathering on, on the chest and the back with black stripe down the middle and uh, a yellow throat. And they're actually very common. This one is, is, they don't have very attractive calls. This one's screaming its heart out early in the morning. The Tanzania red-billed hornbill is a Tanzanian endemic um, whose range extends into, just into the, the Serengeti. And Fisher's lovebirds is another special of this area and endemic. Um, and they also occur in, in pretty good numbers and are quite easily to see. Probably the hardest of, of the special, one of the hardest of the special birds is the red-throated tit. Um, they live in, in small flocks in woodland areas. Um, and also the gray crested helmet shrike. This one actually took me a, a couple of trips to see. Um, and this is endemic to, to uh, Serengeti and just uh, ranging just into Kenya, north of that. Um, and it's, it differs from the white crested helmet shrike by the half color on the chest and a lack of, of bare yellow skin around the eye and this uh, large gray crest versus a white crest. Another very special bird that we have to go to specific areas to find um, is the Karamoja palis, a little gray palis with white wing bars, white tail. And it only occurs in areas of, of whist, dwarf whistling thorn. So the, 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 the thought, uh, short stand, uh, stands of, of acacia thorns, thorn trees, and they have these big round um, nodules on the bark. And these actually are habitat for, for a certain ant that is attracted and actually fed by the trees. And uh, in, in exchange, the ants um, uh, basically protect the trees from grazers. And these, these nodules actually have uh, holes in them for the ants to enter and exit. And when the wind blows, they produce a whistling sound, hence the name whistling thorns. And this Karamoja palis is restricted just to these areas and tiny populations from northern Uganda down to, to the Serengeti ecosystem. Another endemic is the Usambira barbet, very cute little um, colorful barbets. And finally, the rufous-tailed weaver. This is an ancient link between weavers and sparrows and quite an unusual bird with this pale blue eye. So the, the people who made the Serengeti famous um, were, were two German uh, scientists who came out in the 1950s from the Frankfurt Zoo, Bernard and Michael Jemek. And they flew down in this uh, zebra painted airplane and uh, did surveys of the Serengeti, which at that time, although it was formally protected, um, was in quite a bad state of affairs. And they wrote the, the book, Serengeti Shall Not Die, and made a movie and, and actually created a huge amount of awareness for the Serengeti, which led to much stronger protection, in particular of the great 
uh, wildebeest migration for which this area is most famous. So about 2 million um, wildebeest now uh, form this, this huge migration um, across the Serengeti. And it's the, the largest population of big animals that still roam planet Earth. And they, they move in an annual cycle around the Serengeti and are joined on their journey um, with about 250,000 plain zebra, about half a million Thompsons and Grant's gazelle, and tens of thousands of topi, coax beast, and elant. Um, this is just a view of these, these great herds of, of wildebeest that, that you can see in the Serengeti. So they, they basically do a circular pattern, which is affected by seasonal rainfall. From December to April, which are the wet months in the um, grassy Serengeti plains, especially the plains uh, closest to Ngorongoro Crater. Um, and this is when, when there's, there's beautiful lush green grass that's very nutritious. And about half a million wildebeest calves are born in a two, two to three week period. And the reason for this is that this incredible glut of youngsters supplies enough food for all the predators and still allows the majority of, of the young to, to survive because the predators just can't eat half a million calves or all in a, a two to three week period. Once the, these plains have been eaten out and starts to get dry, so May to June, they start forming really large herds and, and move to the northwest, to the wetter scrublands closer to, to Lake Victoria and the Kenya border. And um, you know, a lot of the predators even follow these migrating wildebeests and other animals. And as I mentioned, there's large numbers of zebra also join the migrating wildebeests and, and tens of thousands of, of gazelles. Um, in August, towards the end of the, the dry season, they then move northeast out of Tanzania, across the Mara River into Kenya, where rain then arrives due to the intertropical convergence zone. And it's during these, these crossings where it's really, really famous um, that these giant crocodiles that wait all year in the Mara River for, for the wildebeest, wildebeest migration to come across, um, then um, go out and, and grab as many wildebeest as they can during their crossing north into Kenya and then south again into about two months later in uh, October when they come back into the uh, plains of, of the Serengeti in, in Tanzania. So that's the basic uh, life cycle of, of the wildebeest uh, migration. And um, that's basically my slideshow that um, uh, of the Serengeti and, and uh, Ngorongoro Crater, truly one of the world's most remarkable places. Um, at Rock Jumper, we do offer quite a few tours to this area. Um, we, our tours basically incorporate Serengeti and Gorongoro, as well as other parks in Tanzania and in Kenya. Uh, it's an 18-day tour, which uh, visits the most famous parks of, of Kenya and Tanzania. Um, we do also have longer ones just in Tanzania. And um, one of the best things about these tours is, is we have very small groups, just six participants. Um, with a, a rock jumper guide as well as a local um, driver guide and um, yeah it's, it really is uh, one of the most remarkable trips of the world and in, in one of the world's last great wildernesses. So thank you very much uh, for your time I hope you enjoyed uh, the webinar and um, hope you can join us again next week for our, our next one. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Adam. Thank you so much. Um, great. We have a bit of time where we can do some uh, questions and answers, and we've had a few that have come through here, Adam, quite a few. Um, so, yeah, if you guys would like to, anyone who would like to stay on and, and listen to the Q&A, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, so, yeah, there's a few that are quite personal here as well, Adam, but uh, I think we'll go into into some of the more general questions uh, to start off with. So one of the, one of the questions here Katie's asking is, is it common to see the cats during the daylight hours? Yeah, without a doubt. So, so lions are, are largely active in, in the daylight hours. Um, they do most of their hunting at night, but um, you see a lot of really cool behavior, especially in the early hours of the morning um, and then the late afternoon. 
Um, leopards are, are um, more nocturnal, but uh, as I mentioned, you often see them sleeping on the trees during the day. Um, and cheetah are completely diurnal. So, so they're some of the more fascinating cats to watch um, during the day. Um, and that's when they do their hunting. The smaller cat species are more nocturnal than diurnal. Um, serval is, is particularly active during the day, so we see that one fairly often. Um, but caracal and African wildcat you usually only see so sort of very early in the morning or, or late in the evening. But you, you do get many, many sightings uh, of cats uh, during a, a trip to the Serengeti and Ngorongoro. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, someone asking, are there pangolins uh, in Ngorongoro and the Serengeti? Um, I haven't heard of pangolins in Ngorongoro, but uh, they certainly are in the Serengeti. Um, one of our tours has seen a pangolin that I know of. It could be more. I don't keep exact track mm. of them. But they are extremely elusive uh, anywhere. Um, so you've got to be very lucky to, to see a pangolin. Actually, West Africa is probably more reliable for seeing pangolins, um, uh, the, the boreal species, uh, at night. You can spot light. Um, mm. Whereas here, these, these terrestrial species um, are very tough. But they are there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I mean, places like, as I say, West Africa, Ghana can be particularly good for like long-tailed pangolin or what have you. It's, no, I mean, still, you have to be lucky, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they certainly are around. Um, so quite a few photos as well, Adam, about the camera equipment that you've used, the, the photographs and what have you as well. I mean, the, the photos in the, in the presentation are absolutely mind-blowing. Um, and we've got quite a few people wanting to find out what type of camera equipment uh, you use to, to take the images. Um, great, yeah. So, so when, when, I, when I go to a place like the Serengeti where there's a lot of wildlife, so I'm not just photographing birds, I'll take two, two cameras. Um, so I'll have a, a 1D, Canon 1DX with a 300mm lens, um, f2.8. Uh, that I use for wildlife photography. The, the 1DX is full frame. And then I, I use a Canon 7D Mark II, which has a 1.6 crop factor. And on that, I have a 500 millimeter F4 lens with a 1.4 converter. So that gives me uh, 1,120 millimeters. <laughs> and I use that uh, for bird photography or more distant animals. Um, obviously, close birds as well, I'll, I'll use the full frame. Um, but that's, that's what I've used for, for these images. Uh, about 90% of the pictures here are mine. A couple are, are from Maurice Kutsia, from my, my partner in RX Photography, and a couple of, are from um, some of the Rock Jumper guides. Great. Um, and then also someone asking, what time of the year were the photos taken? So we generally do our um, trips to Serengeti in um, April and May. And the reason for this, this is actually the green season. There's a lot less tourists because you can get very high tourist numbers. Um, th there's a little bit of rain, usually in, as in the form of afternoon thunder showers, but it, everything is beautiful and green. The birds are, are in, in full breeding plumage. The, the weavers are displaying, the widow birds are jumping up and down. It's just an absolutely fantastic time of year. Um, you know, the, the little bit of rain gets, gets the activity going. Um, and you can see in most of these pictures, there's a lovely green background. Whereas if you go uh, in the more popular sort of uh, June, July, August months, it's, it's, it's much drier then and you get a brown background to everything. Um, it's also uh, the May, June year, time of year, April, May time of year, um, which is officially the green season with the lodges, um, also makes it a little bit um, less expensive than, than the peak of the mm. season. Spot on. Um, and th that kind of ties in. There's a few other questions around here about the favorite time to visit and when is the best time to visit. But I think you've, you've answered that um, in a nutshell. They're quite nicely already. The Serengeti is great pretty much any time of the year, except sort of uh, August, September, October, when the wildebeest migration is in Kenya. Then, then it's probably better to, to maybe visit the Masamara to mm. see the wildebeest. The rest of the year, they're in the Serengeti ecosystem, so you can find them. Um, so, so yeah, different times of year have, have different features, but certainly for a combined birding and wildlife tour, I can't more highly recommend April, May. Mm. Mm. I agree 100%. Um, and then someone just asking about ma malaria medication. Um, is that required when visiting Northern Tanzania? 
Yeah, so you are in, uh, officially in a malaria area, so it is better to, to take uh, prophylactics. Um, you know, it, it's fairly low risk. I've, I've not heard of, of anyone taking, or actually getting malaria there. Um, I personally don't take any prophylactics uh, when I visit this area, um, mm. but it's, it's definitely something, there, there is a risk. So uh, depending how risk adverse, but certainly you should consult your doctor and uh, probably take prophylactics. Yeah, yeah, good advice. Um, and then regarding lion cubs, uh, Kate's very keen to, to see lion cubs. Is there a specific season um, when it's best to see lion cubs? Um, no, lion, lion births aren't, aren't particularly seasonal, so they can happen any time. So yeah, you can see lion cubs at, at any time of year. And with, with such large numbers of lions in the Serengeti, you, you're bound to see cubs. All right. Excellent. A um, couple of others here. What are some of the good natural history books um, in this area? So not, not just the field guides, but actually books that have got some stories about, uh, about Tanzania. Do you, do right. you have yes. any? So, so Serengeti Shall, Shall Not Die by Bernard Jemek is, is a wonderful story. Um, sadly, Michael, his son, um, actually died in an airplane accident with a vulture on, on the slopes of Ngorongoro and his memorial, we actually, we actually see it on our tours. So it's a wonderful story about the Serengeti. Um, another book I can highly recommend, not only just about the Serengeti, it's Alan Root's autobiography called Ivory Apes and Peacocks. And he was one of the first um, wildlife filmmakers in the area, spent a lot of time in the Serengeti and um, it, it really comes across how special the Serengeti is in, in his book. He also uh, covers a lot of time in Kenya and, and even Congo, but that's a wonderful book to read. Uh, Alan Root, Ivory Apes and Peacocks. Mm. Fantastic, thanks for those, Adam. Um, and then someone else asking, there's a couple of little more personal questions here um, for you. Someone asking what's your most wanted mammal or bird to see from the area? <laughs> uh, and, why, and why that might be. <laughs> uh, Keith, you probably know the answer. For me, I, I have a nemesis. I've never seen an art farm. Um, I've done a thousand night drives and I've, I own a game farm, a game lodge where there's art fox being seen on the driveway and uh, I've just personally never seen an art fox. So that without a doubt would be my most uh, wanted animal. However, night drives unfortunately are, are not allowed uh, in the Serengeti, but you can do them in the Grumeti. Um, on the birding front, um, yeah, I have seen every bird that, uh, that occurs in the area. Um, my last one that, that I finally got after a few trips was the Great Crested Helmet Shrike. So that, that, that one took me a while. Um, others have been lucky mm. on their first trip, but um, yeah. <laughs> And I've seen all the birds, not photographed them all. Um, so, so that's a fun challenge. Always something to go back for, that's for sure. I mean, this area, you know, that's why I did a family trip there. There was nothing new for me. Yeah. It's such an amazing part of the world that you can just go back to it over and over again. Without well, that's doubt. it. I mean, if you, yeah, yeah, you, you can. I mean, it's just the experience is it's pretty, pretty phenomenal. Um, I guess people, someone asking as well here about uh, Kenya. They've done a, a Kenya safari before, and you know, can they? Uh, what you know? What do you think about doing northern Tanzania um, as an option? Would it be a viable option having done Kenya already? So it is different to Kenya. Um, you know, the, the the last ten or so birds that I showed um, in the slideshow, um, you wouldn't get in Kenya for most of them. They they are more specialist birds of the Serengeti ecosystem. Um, although a couple of them do occur in, in the, the Masai Mara. Um, but the Serengeti itself is such a, a vast wilderness. It's very special to experience. And then Gorongoro Crater has to be one of the greatest places in the world. And then when you combine that with what else is in Tanzania, so um, Tarangira National Park or moving further south into the east and west or Simbaras and the, the um, uh, eastern arc mountains of, of Africa, Salu, Ruha, um, and then Pemba and Zanzibar, uh, you know, Tanzania has got, I think, over 80 endemic birds. So, so it's, it's, it's got a lot of, of very special species um, that you yeah. don't get. 
But of course, they're, they're neighboring countries and there's a lot of overlap, especially in the bushveld ecosystem. Um, Kenya, again, has more, more species coming in from, from the drier zone up northern Kenya that don't really make it into Tanzania. Um, so if you love Africa, they're definitely two destinations that you should do. Um, you know, if, if, if you've only done one trip to Africa and it's Kenya, uh, I would maybe recommend doing South Africa and then maybe Ghana or something in West Africa before mm -hmm. concert. Tanzania because you're going to get quite a lot of, lot of overlap. But once you've done other areas of Africa, um, then definitely a, a return trip to Tanzania would, would be worthwhile. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. And I guess, I mean, if you're just coming for a safari experience, then, you know, you sort of think of the, the Kenyas, the Tanzanias, South Africa, Botswana, uh, Namibia, and a kind of, yeah, you, you have a completely different experience in all those countries. Uh, just from a pure safari point of view, so um, yeah, I think Northern Tanzania definitely a definitely a good option. Um, sorry, this one's just come in now. Uh, a brand new question. Uh, just been reading about increased poaching in Africa with the lack of tourists due to COVID nineteen. Any additional info on this? Are the destinations where tours are being conducted now, or are all on hold due to COVID? So, uh, basically everything's on hold due to COVID. So some of the parks, uh, certainly in, in South Africa, um, and I'm sure in Tanzania, um, are open uh, mostly on day trips. Um, uh, I believe in Tanzania is actually more is open than, than you know, some of the lodges are, are also open, I believe. But the problem is, is getting to these countries with most of the airlines shut down. Um, so for tourists, other than domestic tourists, it's, it's virtually impossible to, to visit any of these countries at the moment, unfortunately. And I think there's little information on the ground on, on how this is being, how, how you know, poaching is, is being exacerbated as a result of, of less protection. Um, I, I don't have that information, but I'm, I'm sure there's more opportunities for poachers now that there's less presence of, of tourists and safari guides and, and possibly even rangers. I can only imagine that's what's happening, but um, mm. you know, every, everything's basically shut down. Tanzania is actually one of the countries that, that hasn't done a massive quarantine program, and we don't really know. They stopped reporting COVID figures in May or, or early June in Tanzania, so we actually, they, they didn't, they had very few cases, um, but we, we, no one really has an idea what's going on in Tanzania at the moment. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I believe um, Kenya's opening its its borders as well on the first of August, so they're going to be moving moving back into that safari scene. But I guess yeah, it remains to be seen how many flights are actually coming in, and um, yeah, how the lodges respond and what have you as well. Um, great, and then just to finish off on a more um, on a more personal note, uh, the, the the last question specifically. Um, what was your most thrilling wildlife experience or particular day in Tanzania or perhaps the best discovery from there if you if you have one to share? Phew, I've just had so many great experiences. Um, I, I think just being in amongst um, the wildebeest um, in, in the, in, when, when they've just given birth to half a million young um, was one of the most uh, thrilling experiences that um, you know, just on this huge plain just completely surrounded by bleating wildebeest with cheetahs and and lions and and these packs of uh what what we were known at the time as golden jackal um hunting them down was was just a mind-blowing experience so not much can compare with with experiencing that wildebeest migration um I guess yeah. the way animals are moving and and the noise i mean usually when you see wildebeest they're quite quiet animals but uh, these ones on migration are just constantly calling to each other and kicking up clouds of dust it's it's um, quite spectacular yeah absolutely absolutely thanks so much adam um yeah that's pretty much what we've got time for uh we've gone just past the hour mark so thanks everyone for all your questions and just a few closing comments here adam that have just come through um, Cecil just says, what a spectacular presentation, what beautiful photos, what amazing information given, thanks Adam. 
Um, and Sandy just saying as well, this was awesome. Thank you. And yeah, look, I echo that 100%. It was absolutely spectacular, Adam. Thank you so much right. for thank sharing you. all your knowledge and yeah, and, and those amazing right. slides as well. <laughs> yeah, it was an absolute pleasure. And I look, look forward to doing a, another webinar uh, in time to come. But thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Adam. So then just a, just a quick reminder, folks, uh, these webinars in the series are all being offered free of charge. Um, should you ever wish to donate towards our Tour Leaders I Go Fund Me donation link is still open. And then for those um, folks, yeah, who are thinking of joining us again next week um, or considering joining us, we'd love to, to have you. And we'll be here the same place, same time. And it's going to be Greg de Klerk next week. Um, he's one of our homegrown South African guides, and he's going to be talking about one of the most, another real iconic uh, reserve, uh, the Kruger National Park here in our beloved South Africa. And obviously, it's also famous for its uh, big game and wildlife and, and a massive uh, conservation history. Uh, Greg spent a lot of time uh, guiding in Kruger and at, at adjacent reserves as well to Kruger, knows the area like the back of his hand. And um, yeah, it's an area that's got a lot of uh, fun memories for me as well. I know Adam spent a lot of time in Kruger too. Um, but yeah, for me personally, I mean, I've been visiting since I was tiny, tiny before I was six years old, sort of five, six going on my first trips there. And we did almost, um, you know, sort of once, twice, even three times a year visits to Kruger um, with my brother. And it's just got so many wonderful memories. And yeah, if any of you have been there, I'm sure you've got uh, some, some great memories of the place as well. So yeah, consider joining us for that one. And if you haven't been before um, and you'd like to see a little bit about uh, what it's all about, it, um, it is a major tourist draw card. It's got a, a fantastic reputation and I have no doubt that you will um, get a lot from Greg's, uh, Greg's webinar. It's bound to be filled with uh, wonderful photos as well and, um, and some of his personal experiences there too. So yeah, join us next week for, for that one. And um, yeah, finally, from all of us at Team Rock Jumper, thank you so much for joining us and goodbye. Bye.